surgery the next day. Anyway, he, he was a bit knackered, mm -hmm. um, and he went into a lay-by, went to sleep for a couple of hours, and then drove out onto the motorway without indicating, at which <coughs> he was arrested by the police, who said they wanted to um, breathalyze him. And he said, no, 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 no way. I can breathalyze myself. <laughs> <laughs> if he had been breathalyzed by them, he, they would have realized that he was under the limit and it was all fine. Anyway, he insisted on breathalyzing himself, at which he was uh, charged and he, his, his license was taken away for a year. So he did his surgeries and on call at night on a bicycle, as mm -hmm. you probably remember, Anna. <laughs> anyway, um, that was the end of the Skegness story. <laughs> Anyway, Dave was an East End GP, as you all know, and he wrote masses of articles, uh, columns and reviews, and he wrote four books as well, which are, some of them are here. And the pieces that Nigel, David Brenton and I selected for this book range from Oz Magazine articles. He was, after all, the editor of Oz, while the three editors, Felix Dennett, Richard Neville and Jim Anderson were in prison for producing the school kids Oz. Inc, New Society, New Statesman, Time Out, City Limits, Socialist Worker, Socialist Review, The Guardian, Esquire Magazine, and a regular column for the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, and Temporary Hoarding, the Rock Against Racism paper, which probably Roger will be talking about a bit in a minute. The uh, book has taken, as Canvas said, 25 years, because Nigel and I <coughs> went through his files after he died, um, and he kept his uh, files of his published and unpublished articles very, very uh, uh, carefully dated in, in these files. Well, we went through all those and decided it really would be a good idea to publish a few, and then uh, we sort of got involved in other things for about 20 <coughs> years. <laughs> Finally, five years ago, when we found out that Preserving Disorder, which uh, had been a collection of his articles that he'd put together and Pluto had published, it was out of print about two years ago, we decided that um, we would uh, put together this book. What we, why we did so, I think, was to make Dave's writing relevant to, to a new generation. And although recently books such as Rogers and Red's and Daniel Rachel's have come out that included Dave's work, particularly for R, we wanted to show the wide range of Dave's interests. So we asked friends and colleagues of his to write introductions to the sections of the book referring the content of the pieces to the present and the future and contextualise them for a new audience. This is why the book is dedicated <coughs> to the youth of today and tomorrow. As for today is concerned, I think Dave would have been appalled at some of the shenanigans of those in power, whether to do with the restrictive rights imposed on all of us in this country, the conditions of so many displaced in <coughs> Europe or Syria, the bellicose language of the right and the blatant racism, hate <coughs> and sexism of the extreme right. But he would have, I think, been enthused by the political engagement of the young and diverse communities. We hope to show how Dave's interests and writing covered a wide range of topics, from the politics of health and his commitment to the NHS, to issues of equality and an in informed enthusiasm for popular music and the arts. <coughs> but running through his pieces is a commitment to socialism and a diverse audience he said in rather a serious letter I found that he wrote in 1974, quote, <clears throat> the best compliment I ever had was when a Communist Party shop steward took an article of mine, duplicated it, and distributed it 2,000 to 2,000 of his members. But on a lighter note, amongst the notable characteristics of Dave's writing was his eloquence and his irreverence. Sometimes this meant the content erred on the imaginative. <laughs> in a letter he wrote in 1973 to a branch of the International Socialists, both his serious commitment to campaigning nationally for a socialist perspective 
and his irritation with petty-minded bureaucratic convention became evident. I thought I'd just read you this letter because I know Cambys and Anna have heard it and Nigel, but it is quite a good letter. Dear Brighton Branch comrades, he said, Jim Higgins, who was the IS National Secretary, you probably, some of you remember him, has recently passed on to me your branch's motion of censure on my speech at the Brighton campaign meeting, in which you accused me of excessive discussion <laughs> of wet dreams and pop music, <laughs> incoherence and general lack of clarity. <laughs> I have found this motion a little puzzling. I do not understand why you have referred to two asides from a speech which, according to my memory and my speaking notes, dealt mainly with post-war British capitalism, the class struggle over the last two years, and the growth of the international socialists in the rank-and-file movements. I'm also confused by your references to the working class audience I was apparently misleading. Although the gathering was large by the standards of the campaign, it was all also overwhelmingly student. I see little purpose in pretending I'm addressing the AUEW National Committee <laughs> when, when the audience would actually have difficulty becoming delegates to the NUS conference. <laughs> I was briefed to make an enthusiastic recruiting speech, which I did. It is not my fault if Frank Campbell, some of you oh, might... Okay. Yeah, yeah, Frank Campbell, who was a young building worker at the time, who would have given a more extended and informed anal analysis of the politics of the trade unions over the last year, he failed to show up. It is certainly not my responsibility that you choose to spend the first one and a quarter hours of the evening on a rather dated street theatre show. If your branch wished a special <laughs> slant or undue seriousness in my speech, it was the responsibility of your chairman, who I hardly saw, to brief me. <coughs> <coughs> if I have in any way harmed the growth of Brighton IS, <laughs> I am genuinely sorry, but I am bound to say that if the petty, narrow-minded attitude of your letter is typical of your branch's work, then it will need the assistance from me. It will then it will need no assistance from me in spoiling its chances in the working class. <laughs> I would suggest that if Brighton IS wishes to hang on to the dwindling number of <laughs> of IS national speakers who are prepared to visit their branch, they should make a habit of adequately selecting and briefing their speakers beforehand, <laughs> rather than complaining afterwards behind their backs. Could I also, for the third time, ask you to have the courtesy to refund my rail fare? <laughs> <laughs> Not very fraternally. <laughs> Dave was against pessimism, political, cultural, or personal. As Noam <coughs> Chomsky says in his book, Optimism Over Despair, which has just come out, we have two choices. We can be pessimistic, give up, and help ensure that the worst will happen, or we can be optimistic, grasp the opportunities that surely exist, and maybe help make the world a better place. Not much of a choice. <laughs> Even in the depths of despair, Dave found it in him to be positive about looking forward to change. And, to quote, the grand vision, building the future in the moment, as the young relatives of Dave write in the introduction to the last section. In an article Dave wrote for New Society, after one of our daughters, Molly, died, he wrote... <clears throat> but within the misery, there is something politically inspiring. Molly was born and so nearly lived, only because of a chain of organised and unselfish human beings, which stretched for the, from the unknown blood donors whose gift sustained her in the womb, to the nurses who got Molly and us through so many nights, and still spared a thought to tuck a white carnation in her death wrap. In the 1980s, politically dominated by the philosophy of possessive individualism, the NHS still allows a different set of values to flourish, and it makes manifest the spirit of human solidarity, which is at the core of socialism, and which our present rulers are so concerned to eradicate. 
sounds rather familiar. Mm -hmm. While Molly's death is a tragedy, her life is something brave and marvellous. And uh, I just want to say thank you for listening, and I do hope you enjoy the book. <coughs> I'm going to ask Nigel Fountain who, um, to, to, to make his contribution. Right. Just, I would say that when I was talking, when I heard that thing about the letter to Brighton Branch, uh, I was also talking to Jim Nicholl afterwards in the pub afterwards who said that he had to go down to Brighton to sort out the branch afterwards. <laughs> 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 just went. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what ultimately happened to the Brighton Branch. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were um, what I have to say is going to be brief, and what I have to say is really to do with my personal recollections of David, um, or rather, should we say, a very few personal recollections of David. Um, <coughs> I first met David in 1964, and I met him when I was at York University, and David was, in, was on the point of becoming a medical student in London. Um, we first met, and this was to be a pattern reproduced very frequently in our relationship. We first met in a bar at York University, and uh, the first thing that David did, as I recall, was to say, first words were, so you're Nigel Fountain, to which I replied in the affirmative. He then tried to pour some form of amphetamine into the <laughs> pint of beer I was uh, attempting to drink. <laughs> uh, which also represented something of a, a familiar pattern. The relationship between David and I, actually, I realised very early in the relationship with David that either you kind of hit back against him, in which case you could establish a fairly decent relationship with him, or I think in my case at times a very good and warm relationship with him, which I think would, I would like to think typified it. But if you didn't, to an extent hit back against him, he would, he would crunch all over you and you would uh, and you would find he could be extraordinarily rude. He was he had a genius for being extraordinarily rude and unpleasant. But if you got past that you could find he was a, delight, a delightful companion. He could also continue to be extraordinarily rude, uh, <laughs> which he did. Um, now that first meeting <coughs> uh, as I say was in sixty four. 65, and that was at a time, and I think this does have some passing relevance, it was at a time when students, by and large, did not travel around the world, you know, they might get past Bognor and so on, but they were basically going to be based much more in England. Now, one of the things that David did at that time was tour America, and he managed to wind up by methods which remain a mystery to me to this day. He managed to get to Cuba, and he managed to get to the Deep South. And this was obviously in the mid-60s, was a time of incredible uh, political change and political dispute and violence and the, and the time of the civil rights movement. That, I think, was incredibly important for David in the longer term. And it was also important to David because he had one up over pretty well everybody else in England. You know, people were going to the States in the mid-60s, but there weren't that many young students going on that kind of fairly enterprising exercise. And the consequence of that was, I think it gave him much more of a vision than me, who indeed, I mean, I was beginning to travel around a bit in that period, but not on that scale. And it did give him a kind of uh, an insight which was absent from many of us. You know, he talked about going to hear Roland Kirk playing in New York at that time. You know, at a time actually where he recounted that there was a white guy. This was in a bar, and he recalled the fact he was sitting in the bar and Roland Kirk was playing, and a white man sitting in the bar said, "Would you stop that N word?" guy over there playing, and um, I don't want to hear it, you know, it was to this kind of level of open, naked racism, which we thought possibly until recently uh, was not a feature that was going to be around. Um, now, 
that kind of movement meant that by the time David joined the International Socialists, which was uh, uh, it was a time when the three of us, there were three three friends, David, myself, and another David, and the three of us all joined the organisation around the same time. I think I joined first, um, and then David Phillips joined, and Wisry joined, having confided to me, it should be said, that he'd, he'd uh, I'm not quite sure how he put it, but the implication, in fact, he did actually say, I think, he said he was partly joking, I was afraid of Chris Harmon. <laughs> something yeah. those of us who but remember all, Chris Harmon yeah. might say is a perfectly justifiable attitude to have, <laughs> but not that he himself is not a very interesting <laughs> person. Now, that kind of period was the time when we became politically involved, and David was also engaged um, in a process of covering a much wider front than a lot of us were, because David had a connection, one, with the kind of, the left in London, and indeed nationally, it was a consequence of his later tours on behalf of the organisation. But also, he tied in with Oz, and that kind of area of the underground. And that was, I think it was important, because it meant he was preaching to the non-converted, you know, I would say the time of socialist worker at that period, it was actually in many ways a revolutionary magazine in a much better sense than a lot of other papers were because socialist worker at that time did do things like run letters which criticised the organisation without running a 4,000 word reply saying this is a rubbish, this is mini you know, this miserable worm, how dare you criticise the paper kind of thing. This was partly because of Roger Prot, a much underrated figure in the organisation. Um, and the consequence of that was that it was a more interesting paper at a time when others weren't doing it. But he was also combining that with the fact that he was talking to this strange bunch of hippies or alleged hippies in West London. And the effect of that was that it did mean that the organisation, I thought, got to a much broader audience than it would otherwise have done. Um, and indeed, David did go on to do such things as edit or uh, become one of the editors of Oz for, for a period. It was actually the, the point about the school kids Oz, which got the three kids in court, in, which got the three editors in court, was they weren't editing the issue, the school kids Oz. Yeah. That, was the, that was the whole point. It was the school kids who were editing the Oz. Now, does that matter? Well, it was part of that general movement of the time which incorporated, on one hand, kind of revolutionary socialism, but it also incorporated lots of other people who were caught up in the radical movements of that period, and that was, to me, very interesting. Now, for me, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go on into the period of rock against racism, please no, in fact, I'm going to stop very soon. But what I would say I got, once again, personally out of my relationship with David and the three of us, David Phillips and I, the three of us and an extraordinary group of women who we were connected with, um, such as Sheila Rowbottom is a, is a classic figure, Juliet who is obviously sitting here, and others. The effect of that was that we did get in touch with a whole series of movements which were beginning to emerge, such as the women's movement which <coughs> began to emerge at the, in the later 60s at the time when I was saying, there's no need for a women's movement here. We've, we've got everything completely, uh, we've just, well, we've worked everything out pretty well, actually. I think I was possibly wrong about that. Um, but there was a kind of openness about our involvement with, with Marxism at that time, which I would like to think might be true now, and uh, about which I'm not the right age to make a decision, uh, an opinion. But um, to me, the openness of Marxism, it was actually, <coughs> to me, very exciting at that time. I think that was, that was one of the features of it. And I, these days, everything has, in some ways, I think, uh, become rather stale in that area. But there are many other movements, and there are, and there are things within the, uh, shall we say, the um, contemporary political landscape which are very encouraging and some which depress me intensely. 
I realize I have actually gone on much longer than I intended, so I'm going to stop at this point. Um, just saying that uh, he was a wonderful person to know. He was incredibly good fun. He was politically fascinating and intelligent. And as I said earlier, he could on occasions be a bit of a pain in the ass. But that was one of the great things about him. Okay, so next up is going to be Anna and me. Um, Anna Livingston is a GP in Limehouse, and uh, Dave Widgery uh, joined Anna in their practice there. And so you're going to say a you're few going words. To start you're I, I'm going to start. Oh, I'll, do, I'll start, start then. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I want you to cast your mind back a little bit later than the period that um, uh, our, the first two speakers have spoken to June, the end of June, '78. <laughs> Uh, there was a mass meeting held at Bethnal Green Hospital, and they, um, which was a small hospital, um, fairly near Bethnal Green Tube Station, and um, they, they, they met to discuss the closure of their accident and emergency department that the health authority had deemed uh, needed to be closed. And they voted pretty well unanimously uh, that all the staff there, the doctors, the nurses, uh, uh, the porters, the, the, the cleaners, to oppose that with the support of uh, a couple of local GPs. Um, there was David Widgery and there was uh, Liebson, who was the, um, the senior partner in, in what was Dave's practice at the time. Um, we were in a small um, hospital workers branch, which I'll say a bit more about, and through the networking that we've done, um, six other local hospitals staged a 24-hour strike in support pretty well immediately. So the occupation of Bethnal Green um, accident and emergency began uh, uh, to, to stop it being closed really and we carried on working there, the staff carried on working there um, even though the health authority had decided that it should be closed. So if you think about the organisation that that, must, that that involved at the time it meant that ambulances that were officially not allowed to take patients to Bethnal Green continued to bring patients to that hospital. And it was Dave Widgery, a young GP, who was elected chair of the Keep Bethnal Green Hospital um, campaign. And uh, I've got here a picture which I'll hold up, which you can see um, uh, Dave there. Uh, Johnny Snooks, uh, who was a local councillor, Labour Party councillor, uh, putting up casualty open under staff control, uh, with a few of us um, standing in, in the background there. Um, I, I won't say too much more about Johnny Snooks because I think he became a, a fairly right-wing uh, racist liberal um, councillor, but at that time he was good. Um, and um, and, uh, and a partial um, victory was won, uh, and for a short time a limited casualty service was conceded by the Area Health Authority. Um, so those were exciting times. Um, Dave and I were both members of the East London Hospital Workers Branch. I remember... Um, when I was a medical student going to my first meetings, uh, well, we were all whole of London then, uh, on my Honda 50 up from Brixton to a pub somewhere in King's Cross where we used to meet. And I think um, at that time it, was, it seemed to be quite difficult to join the IS because um, they kept on conferring as to whether they wanted more doctors and medical students in the branch and whether they ought to be recruiting more um, porters and hospital workers. But eventually this delegation of Widgery and a couple of others um, uh, came up to me and said that the branch had decided that they would ask me to join. <laughs> uh, I think we're kind of less discriminating now. But anyway, so so we so I joined and I was this young, just qualified doctor, and he was one of the people. Dave was one of the people who persuaded me to join. Now, what was really exciting about the time is that we used to publish our rank and file newspaper, which was called Hospital Worker. That Dave would. Um, write articles for and inspire us to, to write. And um, I don't know, um, you know, we used to make these uh, magazines up, um, stealing photographs from socialist worker, annoying, uh, I think it was, Dave, was it Starrick, was it? John, John Starrick. John Starrick, who used to, you know, we'd never pay him for the, for the uh, copyright on his photographs, and he would get very grumpy about this, and we'd stick them down on, on, on wax and cut them out with scalpels and stick them on the page. 
We'd have these things that run off the, uh, somewhere in Hackney there was a factory called the Conditioned Air Factory, I think, that, uh, um, that where we'd print out these uh, strips of print, stick them down, and then we'd have to use Letraset for the, um, the headlines. Now, do people remember Letraset? You know, you'd have to cut out your letters and uh, you wouldn't have a P, uh, or, or say you'd take an R and you'd cut off the downstroke of the R and all that kind of stuff. So we ended up with uh, things like this that would, um, you know, would be produced and uh, the hospital worker, this is April 79, and I think this one actually, it, it, the headline, the caption was done by your husband actually, he was a trade <laughs> union leader who I think was, oh gosh, what was his name there, um, do you remember? He was in charge of Newpy, um, anyway, he, the, the, the caption is, Roger this, Green, isn't it? Hmm? Roger Green. No, 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 no. come, come to me in a minute. The caption was, there's something up my nose, but I'm too afraid to pick it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so these sorts of things had a certain spark of humour. Uh, and, uh, and we used to sell thousands of these. And the branch would distribute them uh, around lots of different hospitals and so on and so forth. And, uh, and the core of that, the core organisation, where it's our SWP uh, or the IS branch, uh, and um, we would have jumble sales to, to, I remember Sheila Rowbottom coming along once and helping us set up our jumble sale to raise money for the paper and so on. And uh, so, so the paper was exciting and it was Dave's flair and pro style coupled with the, the reporting coming in from all around the country of hospitals that were on strike and so on that, uh, that, that, that made, <coughs> made us a, a really vibrant force between us. Um, I think Dave wired his imagination into a solid network of shop stewards that existed around the country. So I have a debt to David from those earlier days of hope. And the sorts of strikes that we had at that time, rank and file strikes, particularly at Queen Elizabeth Children's Hospital, Moorfields Eye Hospital in the East End, where the shop stewards would call unofficial strikes, which were settled and won really before the trade union officials came in and really got involved. And it's been a long time, really, since we've had those sorts of strikes. But I do sense a feeling, you know, with the junior doctor's strike that happened uh, a year or two ago, <coughs> that you started to see that sort of imagination <coughs> bubbling up again in the way that the junior doctors, um, you know, brought their imagination back on the streets uh, in that strike. So I'm optimistic uh, that the sorts of organisations and imagination that we achieved in those periods in the 70s are beginning to resurface again now and I think there's a new generation of militants and so on that I think we can hopefully uh, draw into our networks uh, and bring back uh, the spirit of imagination that Dave brought to us from those days. So thank you. Thank you. So, you want to say something yeah. about Dave's okay. involvement yeah. in the practice? Well, I'll start yeah. off by saying I didn't do medicine first of all and one of the things when I was thinking about doing medicine that um, rather encouraged, encouraged me was when uh, we had within a woman in history group and Sheila Robotham came to speak and she said, my boyfriend, she was at the time, is a doctor. And I'd been sort of, and there was a whole radical movement among medical students and junior doctors in the early 70s. They produced a magazine called Needle and so on which parallel some of these activities which Cambys has been talking about, but obviously with much broader in terms of the left and the party and so on. So uh, David was somebody that I and other people on the left in medical school of medicine were very aware of. Um, fa fast forwarding, when um, I... Um, went, well, in the, in the early 80s, we ran... There used to be... A, there is still, and there was, a left-wing doctor's part of what's now Unite, called the Medical Practitioners Union, and we used to have a group in East London, and David was a very active member of that, so while we were still junior hospital doctors and so on, we were all going to the same meeting and, and discussing things and trying to build up the kind of progressive left in, in medicine. And at the same time, because the sad story of Molly brings that to mind, that was also when we felt very involved in that very sad, um, well, very joyous birth and sad loss. Um, and I went into practice in 83 having, um, having trained in general practice in Tower Hamlets and trained at the London Hospital, which I must say that was rather a shithole, and <laughs> had um, some very racist fellow medical students. And therefore, 
was um, got my support from a women's group and the <coughs> union and I left to kind of survive the experience really to begin with. Anyway, after I trained, I uh, the East End was full of lock-up surgeries, that's to say they were closed most of the time, full of very ancient doctors who exploited junior doctors, and I think the patients got quite a bad deal. And I went into one such surgery. David coined a phrase in some of his writings, he called it the queue outside the sick shop door, mm. because when you went round the East End, you would see these queues, and in fact, in one of my training practices in Spitalfields, I did used to arrive in the morning, and the queue would go around the corner, and the patient's notes would be stacked up like that with pre-written prescriptions. And uh, I was very untidy, therefore I would knock over the pile and therefore lose the order, which caused problems. Um, so that sort of illustrated what the situation was like then. So that was 83 when I went into that practice, at which time we, we would all meet up quite regularly. Um, and I should say that I've never actually been in the SWP, but did spend an enormous amount of time in SWP <laughs> meetings, <laughs> and well as well as other ones. Um, and I, um, and after we, we were in the era soon of the, mi the great miners' strike, and the tragic miners' strike. And um, <coughs> Juliet and David had Annie in April 1984, is that not right? And we had our daughter Alice in November 84, and so these, the early months of well, the ends of pregnancies and the early months of these children were spent on demos, supporting minors, having them to stray, to stay, you know, having a very active feeling in our own heads that we were, you know, we were in a way part of the working class movement while being up against the wall in, in general practice. And we were on the demo in about, uh, I suppose it was after the end of the minors strike. I can't, it was, we were on a demo uh, when um, Annie was very small and David came up and said, what's the possibility of coming to join you in Gill Street? Because I had joined a GP who became 80 and another GP who was 77. So being only about 30 or 31 or something at the time, I was extraordinarily young. And we were trying to put pressure on them to retire. One did retire. And so, um, and David was looking around for a practice to settle in because Dr. Leibson was an elderly doctor and he, what David wasn't a partner. And David had decided at that stage that it would be a good idea to become a partner in general practice, which is the kind of career job. Um, <coughs> as a, I suppose, an area of security and settlement in life, while continuing <coughs> wild activism, wild writing, and wild everything else. So <laughs> we had some difficulty because they said, well, you're not 80 to me and the other man with us, with me, and you can't have another partner. But there was a special clause called the Tide Partner. So we said, well, actually, we've got this amazing writer and inspiring person that we want to bring into the practice who couldn't possibly work, work more than two or three days a week or whatever. So then we got permission to take him on. So at that point, David became our partner <coughs> in um, Limehouse, which David Kirby, who's around there, became later on as well. Um, so there we were in, in um, Limehouse working together. Well, as Nigel has pointed out, there were good days and there were bad days. There were days when David was extremely grumpy going off to meet people about literature, or going off to do meetings, or going off to do something or other else, and would rush out of the surgery, leaving me and the other one feeling, oh, God, he's gone again. <laughs> in fact, my then partner, D um, Tom, would say, um, my then surgery partner, Tom, would say, um, oh, he's done a widgery if somebody else has done that, or he's done a moss, that all these people have rushed off. So, but it was really very, um, very interesting and good being a partner with David. And one of the good things was that he was really extremely good at fitting into a number of different situations. So he became a member of the GP's local medical committee, which is the elected body of GP's staff side. He became a member of the group that met regularly with the consultants at the London Hospital, a very respectable group. And in fact, when he did sadly die, they stood in his honor for a minute's silence. So he could be very, um, well, great for everybody. He was great in the GP forums because we had these, because we felt we were all up, up against the wall in Tower Hamlet's general practice and East London general practice. We had a coherent body of GPs who'd be campaigning about the NHS and so on. And David was a great spokesperson and he would articulate to people who were wavering a bit what we needed to do collectively. And he'd also articulate it to management. 
and that was great. But sometimes he'd come back from the practice and he'd grumpy, and that was sometimes less than great. In fact, uh, there was a day when I came home crying and my small daughter drew a picture of a crocodile and said, that's David, and I took it and gave it to David. David was delighted and pinned it on the notice board. <laughs> 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 he didn't lack insight. <laughs> but there was also the time he didn't turn up to a Saturday partners meeting and, and somebody <laughs> rang him and he sort of came up, it was outside London, and it was quite clear he'd had a very bad night the night before. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we, so, and he took on things, like we had a vision of the practice that it would be around everything, maternity, general, general practice, everything. And he went and trained with Professor Huntingford, the then um, well-known obstetrician, mm. along with Wendy Savage in mm. terms of women's choice and abortion and developing services. And that by then, Peter Huntingford had moved to Maidstone. And David went down to Maidstone and spent time on the maternity board and got recognised in being able to provide high-quality antenatal care. We were quite ambitious, so we all wanted to, we all felt we should be inserting coils into women who wanted them to prevent pregnancy. So David had done no gynae, went off and learned how to do that. And there weren't untoward events or anything. He was quite proud in terms of making sure that he did do things safely in that way. I didn't, he, David in some way drew a risk taker. Sadly, his death was from a risk taking as he walked off on the roof while um, trying to repair the roof on one stage and he nearly fell off despite the fact on one side of his body he had a weak leg because of polio. He also had TB in childhood, both things which may have influenced how he was later on going into medicine. But he um, certainly, he was very keen to do well by his patients in all ways. However, there were certain indiscretions. He had various, we used to have those things which were called Lloyd George because Lloyd George was Prime Minister when the pre-NHS panel scheme for working people's um, free healthcare was set up. These little cards like this was where the medical records were written. He, David had very spidery, rotaring handwriting in black and they would sit on the notice board in his room so all the patients could read them. He also, because he thought they were interesting, he'd also run the tape recorder in the desk so there were phrases so that <laughs> he could put them in his books or whatever. <laughs> There's no question of consent. <laughs> 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 Why bother? We, we were in an NHS health centre and books such as um, this one would be all photocopied ready for, pub, for this is a tattoo book of dissent so it's a lot of quotations so the NHS paid very well for this book that needed to be written it was photocopied in great piles so a lot of those sort of things happened but I think the, the main thing to remember is that David <coughs> still has a lot to offer us, a lot to offer us in terms of his writings, which are so diverse and great, and I really commend people to <coughs> read them. And if people want to learn about the history of the NHS, which a lot of quite young people do now as well, his books on the um, mm. NHS in danger, and there was not the NHS, something that there were two called about the NHS, are really good sources. It's not entirely accurate, everything he writes, but his style is great and really allows you to read it and take it in and absorb it and, and produce it as need be. Um, uh, but I, so I really think David is a really important person to have been and he continues to be with us. We did the final thing <coughs> with this book called Some Lives, which is really the last, was that the last book he produced. He wrote it really, um, a lot of it comes from, some part of it was from his work in Bethnal Green, but the other part was sitting in the bus when he'd lost his driving license. Uh, and um, he, he used to tell, I mean, if you read it, you would, couldn't recognise the patients, and they were very happy to be involved, although, again, <laughs> not necessarily pre-consulted with. And the um, computer company that uh, we started all working with in the East End to try and improve the quality of care across the East End, Enos, we were one of the first practices of the part of the campus is one to join it in 1990. They rang us in... Um, in 1990, um, David had been writing a series of articles for the Sunday Correspondence, which was a progressive but mainstream Sunday paper. And they rang us. They said, we really admire you in your practice. And we thought, what's that? Because you're so busy that you see so many patients. Well, there were two elements to that, apart from a really good story about what the devastation that was happening. There was, of course, David... Um, a bit like me being half Welsh, had a tendency to say things are as big as an elephant or as high as a house in terms of the disasters that were happening to people's lives. But the other thing was that there was the whole page 
of the day's appointment book with every name readable on the front page of the correspondent. So um, I will stop there, um, but he was great, and he was great to teach and train and inspire, and people still talk about him regularly. Oh, yes. When we were, when the London Hospital, well, one of the things that happened to the London Hospital is now called the Royal London Hospital, because they were very sorry for the royal family, because Prince Charles and Lady Di, it just wasn't going too well, so they thought that's the time when we should become royal. But they also decided they were going to become a trust. So David was one of the leaders of um, action against them becoming a so-called trust, which was a Tory move in the direction of privatisation. And then um, there were regular demonstrations of GPs on the steps because they were cutting services. So this is one of the events. Actually, that's me. But this is David here. And... GPs, including right one, right wing ones, but came and stood on the steps of the London Hospital. Mary, you might have been there. You suddenly remember those events. We had yeah. two or three of yeah. them. Yeah. So this was part of the kind of action we took, bringing everyone together around the campaign yeah. for health service. And long may it continue. Finally, I'd like to introduce Roger Huddle, who. Um, was involved very crucially in the beginning of Rock Against Racism and all the anti-Nazi League and all the cultural work we did against the rise of racism and fascism in East London to give a, a, a sort of view on, on, on your, <coughs> My your meeting with your take on Witchery <laughs> and, uh, and his book. I think the, uh, I mean, I met Dave, uh, must have been 68, 69, when he turned up at a meeting to speak on uh, what is workers' control. And uh, he came in, and he looked like he looked like something out of On the Road, you know, the someone that Kerouac would have been proud of. He came in, he had that spiky haircut that he always took, always had with him. Looked like he just hadn't combed it, but it always seemed to be the same length. Uh, he came in with a leather jacket on, looking like somebody, uh, some kind of beat poet from uh, San Francisco. Uh, he came in, he spoke absolutely brilliantly. Still the best explanation of what we mean by workers' control I've heard, and that was really an introduction to him, and, and that's when I sort of met him and we started to talk, and, and other things began to develop as we, we found our lives crossed over in, in, lots of, in lots of places in terms of the way we looked at things. Um, at that time as well, in 68, 69, 70, um, after the massive upheavals in, in France and leading to the May uh, the May strikes in May and uh, uh, in May '68 in Paris. Uh, Tony Cliff was really desperately trying to argue with the with the IS that we should shift uh, outwards, that we should move from a federal organisation where we talk to districts and regions, and we should be more centralised. We should build a party on the model of Lenin. Uh, we should be uh, a, a, an activist, centralised, <coughs> revolutionary organisation rather than a collection of of individuals. And Dave took a position on that, really with, uh, with the Democratic Centralists. I, think, I remember the conference when uh, the, we was having the big debate about shifting the organisation. And Dave, um, he stood for the National Committee of the SW, or the IS as it was then, but his election address was based on that he was a reluctant Leninist. And I always think that was the best description of Dave in all his, uh, everything. He, uh, he was reluctant, but he understood the role of the party. He understood that you needed organisation above all else. And he, and he understood uh, what it meant to change from below. And I think that was his, that remained with him certainly all the way through. And uh, I don't hear another couple of things is that all kinds of things were brought to IS in that period. I don't think it was because it was better then or worse then, but there was a, it was a gathering of forces. If you like, in that post, uh, post uh, May days, when the organisation was trying to, well actually the post-war years, when some kind of revolutionary organisation was trying to build itself independently of the Stalinist and the, and the and, uh, model, then all kinds of things happen. And, and if you look at the traditions, Tony Cliff brought, brought into the IS that tradition that goes back to Palestine in the, against the British, against imperialism, the Trotskyist movement of the 1930s. So he was, a, he was that European tradition that came into the IS. And then the other tradition that came into IS was via Paul Foote. Because Paul Foote, public school, uh, Oxbridge, uh, very, very erudite, very uh, 
uh, from the ruling class, if you like, he brought with him Milton, uh, Bunyan, uh, Blake, Shelley. and he was uh, Shelley, and, and he was. Well, I really got to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going through the 17th century. But anyway, so he, um, so, so, brought that into the organisation, that tradition, and they brought a very specific tradition, and I think it. And this is why I think it's important that we read the book and, 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 and keep on reading it. Because what he brought in, he brought in not just the, the hippies of Oz. Um, Peter, it's a shame you haven't got a copy of the school kids issue here. Cause it's I, had, I had it, I was going to bring oh, it. Oh, you should have brought it. Because the greatest picture in it is Rupert with an enormous erection. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was working at the time, I pinned it out and pinned it on the notice board. But, and I think also a sign of Dave's uh, politics was that while he was editing uh, Oz, there was definitely a shift towards the working class. He definitely covered issues uh, about of socialist interest. Um, so wherever he was, he, he always raised that argument, that, that alternative, the socialist alternative, the anti-racist position, the anti-sexist anti position. And I think that was good. But what he brought also, and I think this is crucial, he brought from the European tradition, Surrealism <coughs> and Andre Breton, and he brought Dadaism, and he brought that that intellectual tradition that stood against Stalinism in the early, in the 20s and 30s, but was really lost in the 40s. And the, he was erudite, and he brought, that, he, he brought that tradition in as well. And I think that was a very important addition to the revolutionary movement in Britain that, uh, that, David, that David brought into it. Uh, and the other thing I want to talk quickly about, really, his writing style. Um, see, it's not true that Harmon had nothing but admiration for Dave's writing, and he was always trying to get him to write for the paper. And uh, I think that that writing style, that also came from partly that beat tradition, that kind of uh, Rolling Stones, early 60s Rolling Stones uh, <laughs> journalism about rock music, but also the Beats, Ginsberg, again Kerak, Corso, uh, the Black Writers, Baldwin, all that <coughs> stuff influenced his writing. And he had the ability to write a, a paragraph in which he starts from a generalizer, a, a, a Pacific, goes to a generalization, and comes back to the to the Pacific again. I'll give you an example. He wrote this uh, operation, operation Book Bus. It was in the uh, it was in the uh, Socialist Worker about um, an occupation trying to save libraries. This is one paragraph. Last Thursday, the bailiffs arrived at Goldsmith Road, Somerford Road, Grove, and Howard Road not to evict people, but books. At 3 a.m., protesters who had been occupying the three small Hackney libraries all summer waited nervously behind barricade-sized shelves of Barbara Cartlands, rows of early learning kids' books and racks of reference tomes, large print thrillers and multilingual accounts of young EastEnders' visits to the family back in Bangladesh. Outside, the council mustered its lorries and rolls of corrugated iron to board up the library windows and crates to confiscate the books. A fortnight ago, the threat of strike action by Nalgo Town Hall members and the refusal of council building workers to assist the eviction had temporarily scotched the effort, but Hackney Council remains set on Operation Booklist. I mean, what a fantastic introduction to a, a, to a, to a subject, but the fact that he, he's got multiculturalism in there, he's got children, he's got a little wonderful little dig at Barbara Cartman, I mean, absolutely <laughs> superb uh, writing of the, of the First Order. And then when he, when he started work, uh, the best thing that he gave to Ra in all, it was the writing. I mean, he used to try to sort of put design ideas up and they, they, they were a bit old fashioned. But nevertheless, he, he, his writing was superb around. And the first issue of Temporary Hoarding that we produced, uh, the slogan, uh, Love Music, Hate Racism, was from Dave. The, the idea that we want rebel music, crisis music, music that knows who the real enemy is, came from Dave. And he wrote the wonderful uh, first article on it, What is Racism? And it starts off, racism is as British as Biggles and baked beans. You grow up anti-black with the gollywogs in the jam, the black and white minstrel show on TV and CSE Dumbo history at school. Racism is about Jubilee mugs and Royal Britannia and how we won the war. Gravestones, bayonets, full starvation, and the destructions of the cultures of India and Africa are regrettable, of course. But without our empire, the world's inhabitants will be rolling in the mud still, wouldn't they? I mean, that's <laughs> another fantastic uh, understanding that racism comes from the ruling class, understanding it comes from the British Empire. And just in that one little paragraph, but it starts off with Biggles, the great, the great kind of ion, the, the ionic 
I mean, the hero of the middle classes in, 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 the, in the shires. I mean, he just knew how to do that in terms of his language, and he, and he brought that in beautifully. And I think also he's, he wrote, a, and I actually signed the bloody thing, he wrote a huge article attacking Alex Kalinikos over, in, after the carnival we had, uh, uh, Alex invited uh, a couple of people who weren't involved in riot at all, uh, or the music scene, or punks to write a, a critique of the carnival, we went mad. And David was very rude and wrote a very rude uh, art, uh, piece to Alex, and I signed it, which is very embarrassing. Um, <laughs> if you want to know more about that, you have to read Alex's article in our book on, uh, on reminiscences of Raal. But I think that uh, his writings and his, and his kind of tenacity and that kind of uh, up and down prickly person was a person I found and loved because he would walk and talk and talk about Ginsburg, talk about um, uh, all kinds of, and anything that I talked about, he was, uh, he was uh, so uh, giving that if I said that I liked something, he would find a book that would give it, go to me. And, and the greatest thing I think he, he's ever written, uh, believe it or not, for me personally, was his short essay in 1970, this was, on uh, Mayakovsky the great Russian poet Mayakovsky, mm. uh, The Streets Are Our Palettes. And this had an incredible effect on me. I can't underestimate how, when I read it, how somehow or another it connected with everything that I've been thinking then. And again, it's that example that he, the Mayakovsky, <laughs> the great, he, he understood, because he was in our, our party and because he understood about state capitalism, there was no, there's no Stalinism in his writing. And uh, Mayakovsky's commun communism, uh, Lenin called him, called him a hooligan communist, and I think in many ways <laughs> David would have loved to have been a hooligan Marxist, you know. He would have loved to have had an audience big enough where he could have been the hooligan in it, and he would have been great in it, you know, and I think that was, that was important. Uh, but he, he says about Mayakovsky, his passion was neither sentimental nor cosy, like the cliches of modern Soviet art, those cherry collective farmers, the harmonious choristers, and the agile folk dancers. In his complex love poems, like the uh, Cloud in Trousers and About This, he explores the nature of revolutionary love, trying to untangle his private passions from the larger love of the revolution as the expression of human solidarity and vitality. Through his poems, we can gain a glimpse of the boisterous spirit and feverish energy of the real Russian communism, so deeply buried under the false images of Stalinism. Mm -hmm. And I think this, that, 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 does, that writing and that kind of understanding of the tradition of Mayakovsky, <coughs> of uh, Ginsburg, of Kerouac, of André Breton, um, and all the others that, that they, 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 they lived inside Dave's writing. And, and, and you should read them just to get that pleasure from reading someone who, 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 who just takes the language and bends it and shapes it uh, to what he wants to say. Never waffles, never, never goes round the houses. Um, and I'll say that the last thing I want to say really is about Skegness. There might be a lot of people who don't know about Skegness. Every year for a long time, the IAS and the Socialist Workers' Party had four days at Skegness holiday camp. Some of us remember the horror, some of, the, some of us remember the, the joy, uh, some of us remember that by Saturday night we, we had drunk the bars dry. I mean, it was extraordinary four days, and Dave used to speak there, and that was where he was allowed to do not allowed, that sounds like night, but he, when, he was, when, he could, when he could just speak on something that he was interested in. And that's where he did the Bessie Smith uh, mm -hmm. lecture that uh, Dad put onto, the, onto Facebook yesterday, and you should find it. And, and just listen to him talking, the way he talks about uh, Bessie Smith, Billie Holiday, black women in, in, in the southern states of America, and, the, and above all else, uh, the racism that, that created this great art form, this form of, of, re <laughs> of resistance and revolution that was was Bessie Smith. And he used to go to Skegness. I remember one year, I don't even know what he was talking about. It might have been William Blake, it might have been sex, uh, I don't know. But he said that great thing to me, like, it's always stuck in my mind. He said, what is the British holiday? It is a slap on a wet anorak. <laughs> now only Dave could come up with that, that bloody metaphor that somehow or another sums up the holidays at Dorset or at Blackpool or Skeggy or anywhere. What is the sound? It's pouring with rain, you're eating your sandwiches on the oatmeal because you can't go back in the boarding house and the kid plays up and you give him a slap and it's an anorak. I mean, David just understood that, that, that nature of working life, that, uh, and how he picked it up and got it and everything, I don't know, but that was his, 
that was his that that was his ability. Me and him and Sheila Rowbottom, we formed a small faction uh, called the Magic Faction. Um, I think I was I was in so imbued with that kind of uh, his, his, the sense of, of magic that that, uh, that that period seemed to impose in people. That we formed this little idea, this little anti bureaucratic clique, and we called ourselves the Magic Marxists. And it was uh, Sheila still remembers it when I see it. But I think that the uh, that was that was the great the, the, the great person that he was, in, and, I, and I I really think everybody should read this book and anything else you can get hold of by it. The only sad thing is I think his best writing was in a magazine that him and uh, Nigel worked on called Street Life, and it was set up by the corrupt uh, editor uh, uh, owner of the Daily Mirror, uh, Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Mil not Rupert Murdoch. Maxwell. 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 And it was a, ma a, a, a magazine called. I've been trying to find my copies, but I couldn't find them. Uh, they probably. Oh, so we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he wrote a piece in that, and I think it's the most beautiful writing I've, I've, I've ever read. He wrote of going from his house to the to the uh, the practice on the two five three, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's just it's just a writing about going through Hackney. Mm -hmm. Uh, with, all, with that period at the end when the workers are not going and when the old age pensions are getting on, what they call the, uh, uh, the, two, uh, the two lates, you know, the, is it the two earlies, the twirlies. And it's a beautiful piece about what the people who get on and get off the bus as he travels through to, to, to have beautiful writing. That street life, I think all his writing in street life was fantastic and, it, and we should get all of that and print it as an addendum to this book. Anyway, I think he was a great writer, he was a prickly bugger, um, he was a reluctant Leninist, um, and uh, he believed socialism from below, which is good enough for me. Mm -hmm. so, that's the end of our speakers. Dave, I don't know what the format normally is of these. Do we normally have a bit of discussion and debate? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, what yeah. time is it? Yeah, yeah. So, of course. We're right for time, are we? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, anybody want to throw in contributions and so on? Just, just yeah. yeah, stand up, say yeah, who you are. Jim, yeah. I'm Jim, I, the contact I had, I was a community listening to Hamlet, and the community, I never really got back the, past the frightening stage with Dave, because he kind of knew I was, well, we knew each other because we were both in the same organisation, but he only ever spoke to me once, and that was when, when a, a person I was working with as a community nurse was quite a difficult person, and she occasionally used to go and act out a little bit in his uh, GP practice, <laughs> and he said to me, isn't there an institution for people like that? <laughs> so I think his frustration overcome his radical politics. <laughs> but it's... Uh, the thing is, uh, you know, things that I remember, but uh, anybody who's read the, the piece he wrote about Molly, you know, I remember reading that, yeah. and you can ne you'll never forget that if you read that. Yeah. But the lucky thing is, well, I, I just want to emphasize what Dave does, because people who've never heard that, uh, Dave that would you speak, you can actually hear him speak in 1977 on Bessie Smith, and if you, I've only listened to the first five minutes. But the whole thing is how it's kind of striking today, because he's talking about culture and politics and capitalism, but in a really interesting, exciting, and convincing way. And now, you know, when, to be quite honest, it's so striking because all the other discussion, even on the left, is often it's so lifeless, you know, particularly the establishment, you know, I mean, you know, if you read the London Review of Books and listen to Radio 3, it's all absolute crap, <coughs> you know, lifeless crap that doesn't understand culture where it comes from. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that's striking. The other thing is, you know, and I, you know, I keep saying I have to do, but it, well, I have to do it because there's so many books now about the NHS that are really good about what's happening in the NHS. But Dave, we, the, he was the only person.